We are, we are back in the Psalms, people. Um, we started a sermon series in, uh, in the book of Psalms called Mixtape. Uh, I told you that it was gonna be 16 weeks long, but then we were gonna take a break uh, after the eighth week, which we did. And, uh, and, but now we're back. Uh, so we are now turning uh, the tape. So we're taking it out of the player. We're turning it around to side B and we're putting it back in. And, uh, and we're trusting God uh, to continue to do the great work uh, that he has done and I believe will continue to do. Uh, we launched a devotional with this uh, series. And so uh, if you're brand new to Rooted or haven't been uh, in uh, the Psalm series and you're going, what devotional? It looks like this. You can grab it at the Salbona table. I believe it's 100 Rand, if I remember correctly. I, I think we have a few of these left. So uh, you're more than welcome to grab it and, and jump straight in. In fact, you can go all the way to the back uh, and in your own time, kind of walk through the first eight Psalms that we walked through and then just kind of uh, jump in uh, with the rest of us. Uh, and so you can grab one of these. Uh, if, if you don't want a, a physical copy or maybe they're sold out, uh, feel free to email community at rootedfellowship.com and we'll make sure we'll get you a digital one. And that one is absolutely free. Some people just like to hold things in their hands. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of where we are. We'll be uh, in this series for the next eight weeks and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, and that'll take us all the way to Awaken. Um, now, if you uh, don't know what Awaken is, then, uh, then maybe that's my way of getting you to stay for the next eight weeks because Awaken is absolutely incredible. Amen? Yeah. All right. Now, I-, I couldn't think of a better psalm to kick off uh, uh, part B or side B or the second installment of our psalm series. I couldn't think of a better psalm than Psalm 57. Um, and so if you have a Bible, you can meet me in Psalm 57. Uh, I love the Psalms. I absolutely love the Psalms. Uh, tons of reasons why, um, but one that's pretty up there right at the top is, is I love how, how real the Psalms are. Uh, the Psalms are filled with raw emotion. They don't pretend, they don't perform. Uh, they tell it as it is. And Psalm 57 is exactly like that. It's a Psalm written by uh, David, King David, and he's, he's just keeping it real. That's uh, maybe how uh, the kids are saying it today, or maybe that's what we used to say when I was a kid. I can't remember. But, uh, but David's keeping it real. It's raw emotion. And, and I absolutely love that about the Psalms because what it does is that it should, it should encourage us uh, to be real with our emotions. God already knows what you're going through. So there's no reason to pretend and perform with him. But then he places us in the context of community so that we can be, be kind of honest with one another so that we might seek the help that we need because uh, the community of God, its desire is to constantly point people to God, and that is who you need. And so David's going to do that very thing as we walk through Psalm 57. Now, now look, uh, David's going through a lot in the psalm. All right, he's going through a lot. It's tough. It's really, really tough for him. He's 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 going through some challenges. Um, he he finds himself in a cave, all by himself. Why? Because he's on the run. King Saul, right, is trying to kill him. Now, let me give a little bit of context here. So, uh, if you go read uh, one Samuel from you know, chapter 16, uh, you'll pick up the story of David. That's where he gets anointed. All right. So Samuel gets a word from the Lord, and he says, "Go to uh, uh, go find the next king." And so that's what he does. And so he finds this young boy, uh, probably the age of 15, and he says, uh, "Listen, God has anointed you and wants you to be the next king." All right. So that's where the the story picks up. Uh, now, King Saul, like over time, doesn't like that. We all know the story of David. David goes out um, and kills, uh, oh, it slipped my mind, what's his name? Goliath, there we go, thank you very much. I'm glad you read your Bible. Um, so he, he kills Goliath and, and the people love him, they praise him, right? And, and Saul doesn't like that, right? Jealousy starts to set in. He's like, well, hold on, if, why do people like you more than they like me? And so Saul now wants to kill David and so David is now on the run. I love telling the story because for most of us, we, we like to think we're David. But, but then if you wanna be David, you gotta read all of David's story. He's on the run. He feels alone. He feels isolated. He's, he's now hiding in this cave. And that's where he pens this psalm. And so with that, let's jump in to Psalm 57. David cries out right out the gates, Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me. 
Uh, the New Living Translation says it this way, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy. See, the grace and, and mercy David seeks in Psalm 57 is not exactly the same uh, mercy that he seeks in other places. Uh, for example, Psalm 51. After committing adultery and then trying to cover it up, uh, this is what I call managing sin. Right, so David tries to manage his sin. He commits adultery, he tries to manage it, but then he ends up killing Uriah. He needed forgiving and cleansing. He needed forgiveness. He cries out for mercy in Psalm 51. He, he says in, in verse two of Psalm 51, wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin. But that's not the mercy that he's crying out for here. See, in Psalm 57, David hasn't committed any sin. In Psalm 57, David is in trouble. The, 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 Psalm, the Psalm's title indicates what's going on here. If, if, if we read the, the, the words just above verse one, we're told what's going on here. We're given a little bit more context. Now, look, I know in the New Testament, if you read your Bible, um, you'll see that there'll be headings there. Uh, those headings were not put in there by the original writers of that piece of scripture. Those were added in later uh, by the translators just to help us as we read the scriptures. But, but here in the Psalms, when we read what's here above what, what is written, those are the very words of God. Those were written by those who wrote the Psalms. And so if, if we read what's above Psalm 57, it says this, for the choir director, do not destroy a mikhtam of David. Now you might ask, what's a mikhtam? I'm glad you asked. Um, there's a lot of kind of debate around uh, this word mikhtam, right? And, and I'm, I land with where kind of many uh, theologians land and they say it, it means the engravings. I like that, the, the engravings, because now it gives more context to what's going on here. I can imagine David in this cave by himself because he's, he's on the run. Saul is trying to kill him. And so he, he engraves on the, on the side of the cave, do not destroy. Why? Because in his mind he's going, maybe this will be helpful for some people a couple of years from now. And it is. A mictum of David. He says, this is, this is written by the very hand of David when he fled before Saul into the cave. So there it is. Oh, now how do you know that he's in a cave? He tells us. You'd be, you'd be blown away by, by just reading a little bit above the verse that you love and below the verse that you love. Yeah. The, the context that you'll get, it'll blow your mind. Some of you are like, where does he get this stuff from? It's just a verse above. <laughs> he's on the run. He's in a cave. He's by himself. David is in trouble and he needs help. I mean, it's, it's all over the psalm. It's all over the psalm. Be gracious to me. God, be, be gracious to me. How, how am I in this situation? Did, did you not anoint me and appoint me for a purpose? Like, but what, why am I on the run now? Again, a little side note here. If you believe that you've received an anointing and an appointment from God, expect, expect that people are gonna come after you. Let me double click that. Expect your, your brothers and your sisters in Christ to come after you. You have no idea how powerful sin is. And you might go, well, was David the only one? No, go read Joseph. Okay, maybe just David and Joseph. You know, M Moses' brother and sister God had anointed and appointed him, and they were like, nah, nah. So expect it. It's horrible, but it's, it's real. He's in trouble. He's, he's crying out to God, help me. Help me. Couple, couple things. Did, did I miss a joke? Was it? Oh, I missed it. Couple of things he needs. David needs refuge. 
When he cries out, help me, he, he needs refuge. We, we see this in the, in, in the latter part of, of verse one. He says, for, for I take refuge in you, I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. Now, I know many of us love that verse. We do. We absolutely love it. We've just sung it. But, but I need you to think about this for a moment. He's in a cave. We tend to read this or sing this song and we're like, you know, out in the, in the mountains and, and God's wings, it's so beautiful. And it's, you know what I mean? It's like, that's what we think. But no, he's writing this in a cave. He, he's probably like looking around him and it's, it's the, the shadows that the cave kind of creates. And he's like, you know what? Even this, even this will be sufficient. God, if you can just cover me like the shadows in here are covering me. That's the refuge that I need. He needs rest. He must be exhausted. Because yeah. everywhere he goes, I mean, like, I don't think it was that difficult to miss David. The Bible tells us he was a good-looking man. Yeah. And all the good-looking men say amen. amen. All right, there we go. <clears throat> I know we've got a ton of them here. <laughs> he, he goes anywhere and it's like, is it, is, isn't that David? A and before you, you know it, like, word gets to Saul and it's like, okay, I know where he is. Everywhere he goes, people are like, they're often, because people want to honor the king. The king's put word out there. It's like, if you see David, you tell me. He's exhausted, and so he needs rest. He, he can find no rest. When, when he lies down to, to rest somewhere, he says he, he feels like he's among devouring lions. Who can he trust? Verse four tells us, he says, I'm surrounded by lions. I lie down among devouring lions, people whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. His enemies seek to trap him. Verse six, they, they prepared a net for my steps. I was despondent. They dug a pit ahead of me. But then hear this, but they fell into it, Selah. See, the, the, the trap set by David's enemies ended up trapping the very ones who set it. David, in his current situation, because where is he? In a cave. David, in his current situation, spoke these words with unwavering faith. Although it hadn't occurred yet, he was deeply convinced that it would. That's why he speaks like that. Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me. Help me. Now I know for many of us, this might sound a little weird because we're not used to asking for help. We can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We, we grab our accolades and our achievements. We, we reach out to our investment accounts, our titles, and we're like, no, that's, that's what will save me. Again, David had been anointed. He could have reached to, to his title. And yet he finds himself in this situation and so cries out, God, help me. Friends, this, this is less of an appeal for forgiveness and more of a cry for help. And can I say, it's so comforting to know that the Psalms include many requests for personal yeah. help. Yeah. That you, that you can ask for help. Yeah. Too often we'll go, we'll, we'll hear this and we're like, you know what, I'm thinking about my neighbor. I'm thinking about my colleague. Ooh, you know, this is a good word for, for a family member. Or, or, it's for you. Yeah. For you. Does anyone need help today, then this psalm is for you. It's also important to note, David's longing for a place of refuge did not imply that he expected to escape all forms of suffering. I hope you see that. There is no indication in the psalm that, that, that David held such an expectation. Maybe another way to say it is, is, is David did not have that kind of theology, the, the come to God and all your suffering will disappear. Yeah. He didn't have that. 
And yet we hear so much of that today. If you come to God, then you will never, ever suffer. That is ridiculous. Not this side of heaven. But you can still find refuge. You can still find rest. We don't see David doing that. Rather, we, what we see here is, is David declaring that despite difficulties and obstacles, he maintains an unwavering confidence. Even when there seems to be no clear human reason for that. Does this sound familiar to anyone? When people look at you and they're like, I have, I have no idea how you even got up this morning. <laughs> how are you here? With everything that's happening in your life, how, how, how do you stand there and worship God? Like, how, how do you do that? How do you have this, this, this positive outlook on life? With everything that's happening around us, how? Where does this confidence come from? Where does it come from for, for David? Where, where do we see in the text that he has such confidence? Well, verses three and seven. Verses three and seven, let me read them to you. Verse three says, he, he reaches down from heaven and saves me, challenging the one who tramples me. Selah. Second time we see this word, selah. What does it mean? Well, it's, it's a musical symbol that communicates rest, that, that, that communicates a pause. I, I believe it, it communicates this, this, I'm settled. I'm settled. He reaches down from heaven and saves me, challenging the one who tramples me. That settles me. It should settle you. God sends his faithful love and truth. David says, God sends his faithful love and, and truth. This, this, this faithful love the, in, in the Hebrews, chesed. I love it. Other translations say steadfast love or loving kindness. I, I love it. Every time I see this, this word chesed, I, I, love it. I love it so much because it, it not only speaks of, of God's saving power, but it also speaks of God's nurturing power. Think a little bit of a, the relationship that a, a mother has with their newborn. Both our kids, when, when we brought them back from the hospital a few weeks, you know, as they were at home, we put them to bed and they would cry, They'd wake up and cry because they were hungry. And that cry was, I mean, it was, if, if you have kids, you know. It's that cry that just, you're like, what is happening here? Like, what demonic activity is going on <laughs> in that room? And so I, I would sometimes rush there, you know, and I'd open the door and, and, and they'd, they'd like look and, and see that it's me and they'd be deeply disappointed. I could see, even on a three-week-year-old, I could see it on their face. You have no idea what that does to me. Like, I was just, I was like, I'm going to need counseling for this. Because, because in that moment, they're going, you know, I, I'm glad that you're here, but you're not the person I'm looking for. You're not the person that's going to come save me from my situation. But, but then as soon as mom walks in, you can see it's like, okay, because not only are you going to save me, but you're the one who can nurture me. You're the one who can provide for me. That's what we should think when we see the, the faithful love of God. That's what David is saying is that you have the ability to save me and you have the ability to nurture me, to keep me while I'm in this situation. Is that the God that you know? Verse seven, he says, my, my heart is confident. God, my heart is confident. You should take notice when someone repeats something like back to back. My heart is confident. God, my heart is confident. I will sing. I will sing praises. Where is David? Where is he? I'm telling you, some of us read that and we think he's like, no, I'm at the gathering of the saints. The band is on fire. The smoke machine is going. And so that's when he says, my heart is confident. God, my heart is confident. I will sing. No, he's in a cave and he's by himself. And yet, and yet he can still say this. 
See, he's in a cave. He's, he's, in, he's in desperation. He's in isolation. That's where he is. He's, he's desperate and, he, and, he's, and he's all alone. And it's not, like, it's not because he's made the decision. This is a different kind of isolation. Because some of y'all might go, oh, great. So David can be on his own so I can be on my own. I don't need community. No, 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 no. In his pursuit to be faithful to God, he finds himself in this situation. Why? Because we are surrounded by sin. Jesus says it. He's like, listen, if if you're going to follow me, expect persecution. Expect trials. Expect challenges. I have no idea where this theology comes from where it's like, you know what? You follow Jesus, you're going to be totally fine. That's why so many of us, we want to give up on the faith because we've believed the lie. And so the first time we hit any obstacle, we're like, you see, this this wasn't true. David in desperation and in isolation, what does he do? He worships. He worships. Sometimes the medicine that you need is worship. Sometimes we've just got to worship through it. We need to show up and just go, you know what, I'm going to throw my hands in the air and I'm I'm just going to cry out to you. Help me. And then worship. Sing his praises. David isn't pretending that, that life is free of trouble. He's not denying reality. But neither is he nurturing despair. We, we, have, we have a way, we have a way of, of, of allowing despair to come into our lives. And then when we don't deal with it, we feed it. And feed it. And feed it. And then we wonder why we're so bitter. And maybe you're mature, okay? So you, 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 won't be, you won't be bitter to God, but you'll be bitter with everybody around you. You're so mean. Nobody wants to be around you. Why? Because you're feeding despair. And it's not maturity. It was just, I hope you caught it. It was like, yeah, you're not. See, David, in the midst of all of this chaos, he puts his trust in God. Instead of focusing on what's around him, he focuses on who's above him. Now, I know this is easier said than done, but it is possible. Hear me, friends, it is possible. When one puts their faith in Jesus, it's him who gives you strength. It's him who gives you the ability to look up, not only for refuge, but for confidence. God is good. God is sovereign. God is big. God is wise. And he loves you. That, that, this is why we do what we do. Why would a bunch of people show up early in the morning when it's this cold? It's because we want to be reminded that God loves us. And then we want to tell other people that God loves them. And from the moment you turn and trust Jesus for salvation, he will never leave you alone. Amen. He just won't. Amen. He just won't. He will never leave you alone. And so my, my question to you, if you are a Christian, if you've crossed the line of faith, if, you, if you're a child of God, do you believe this? Do you believe that God will never leave you alone? That he's with you every step you take, even in a cave. But will you put your trust in Jesus for salvation? Because that's where it begins. But what does that mean? What does that mean? I don't want to assume anything. Especially in a context like ours, and I say this all the time. A context like South Africa where where many of us have grown up in the church, many of us know the songs, many of us have have been to the classes, and so so we just assume a lot. So what does it mean? What does it mean to to put my trust in Jesus for salvation? Well, it, it means praying even though it seems like you're just talking to the air. I'm gonna let that one sink in for a little bit. 
Ever prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and just wondered, like, And yet you hear other people going, oh, God speaks to me. I kind of get what they mean. A little bit. Look, God can do whatever he wants. God, God could speak to you so loudly. Like it's just, it, it, it blows your eardrums. But he can also speak so loudly that your heart is just awakens to the wonder of who he is. God also speaks through his word. It means... If God says his book, his word is profitable for teaching, for for rebuke, for correction, for instruction and training in righteousness, then that means we will read it and we will believe it. That's what it means. It means if God tells us that by the spirit we, we put to death the deeds of the flesh, then it means that we go to war with sin. We don't play with sin. We don't try to manage sin. We go to war with sin, our own sin. It means that if my feelings are telling me that that God has forsaken me, if you're hearing that, if you're hearing the the, the lies of the evil one, that that he's he's no longer with you, that you've you've committed such, such a great sin that he cannot forgive you. That he's turned his back. He's just like, like if, if, if you hear that, then, it's, then, then when you put your, tr- putting your trust in Jesus for salvation is to go, you know what? That's not true. That's not true. It's to recognize that your feelings are lying to you. I, I say this all the time, really. I, feelings are great. I'm not against them. And we all have them. Guys, you also have them. Now, sometimes you'll feel like, well, I don't have emotions. No, you do. We all have them. They're great. They help us navigate life, but they are horrible saviors. Horrible saviors. But let me say it this way. Fe- feelings are great consultants, horrible CEOs. Horrible CEOs. You know what a consultant does? They come in, and uh, I apologize to all the consultants in the room. <laughs> I'm not against your profession. Everyone needs to make money and put food on the table. I used to be one, so it's, it's totally fun. But a consultant comes in, looks at everything that's going on, and then consults. Here's what I have observed. And they may even suggest some things. Here's what you should do. But at the end of the day, it's the CEO who makes the decision. Who's the CEO of your life? Is it you? Or is it the one who is seated on the throne, who is fully in control? So get those feelings and go, okay, what, what's going on? What's, what's happening? What's, okay, cool. And then bring them before God and go, is this right? How then should I respond? So, so you know what we're great at responding at? False narratives. Oh, we're, we're amazing at that. Something happens and then you're like, well, let me go away. Let me feel the feels. Let me create this whole narrative of what, and then let me show. This person hates me. They don't want what's good for me. How do you know that? Well, when they turned, their one eye quickly looked at me and then looked away. I'm like, are you, are you, are you serious? We put our trust in Jesus for salvation. Paul uses this phrase, let God be true, even though everyone is a liar. Romans 3 verse 4. And that's helpful. It's a helpful truth in light of fighting for faith. The fight of faith is contending to believe that whatever contradicts God's word is a liar. We'll let that one settle in as well. If anybody says anything other than what God's word says, then they are a liar. But what if? They're my teacher. Is it going against God's word? Then they're a liar. Social media, I mean, that, that's dead giveaway. Dead, dead. If it has a hashtag, you know it's a problem. God is true. And every man, every humanistic philosophy, every cheap thrill, every inappropriate image on the screen, and I'm not, 
every, every rival God is a liar. Yeah. Trust in Jesus for salvation. It is to put your faith in the gospel. In the good news of Jesus Christ. Look, according to scripture, th this is the overarching story of our lives. God will send a savior from heaven who will save all who put their trust in him. That's as, as simple as I could put it. If you believe what Jesus did on the cross for you, counts for you, then you will be saved. That is to put your trust in Jesus for salvation. As Christians, we must be convinced of this. At the end of the day, every false refuge will cave in. Yeah. Amen. And Christ will be seen as the one true King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Re rebellion against him will not go overlooked or unaddressed. God will judge human sin. And I know that this is not like a popular thing to hear these days, but he will. It's inevitable. The, the reality of judgment against sin is one of those central claims of the Christian faith. It's an inescapable truth. And yet another beautiful truth of our Christian faith is that God has provided a savior. He will, he will judge sin, but he has provided a savior. Je Jesus came and lived a perfect life. He died on the cross to pay for our sins, satisfying the full wrath of God. He rose from the grave, the empty tomb forever declaring his defeat against sin, death, and Satan, granting full forgiveness and new life for all who believe that it counted for them. Amen. We must be convinced of this. If it sits within us as a suggestion, as an option of one of the things that God has given us, then we've completely missed it. We will rot in the cave, waiting for some false savior to come and get us, and he or she will not come. We must anchor ourselves in the gospel. David speaks of, of the God of salvation who reaches down from heaven and saves him, who sends his faithful love and truth. God hasn't stopped doing this. He hasn't stopped doing this. In desperation, in isolation, God uses this. None of it is wasted. He is in desperation. He is in isolation. And God uses this because he recognizes who God is and so God uses this for David's preparation. Now you might ask, what, preparing him for what? For everything, for everything. I believe David learned so much. There was, there was let's go on with these uh, 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 T-I-O-N words, right? So it's in desperation, he's in isolation, there's preparation. I believe God is educating. There is education that's happening in that cave. There is education happening in, in your season where you're just going, you know what, I feel, I feel like so alone. I feel like, like sin is just everywhere. I feel like I'm isolated. I feel like God's preparing you for something. If you will recognize him for who he is, he's preparing you for something. He's molding you and shaping you. The question is, will you sit under his teaching? Will you sit under his teaching? Are you in a tough spot? This morning, are you in a tough spot? then seek his grace and mercy for refuge. And then trust in his salvation. Trust in his salvation. And, and, then, and then lastly, wake up and make him known. You're trying to figure out how, how is all of this connected. 
How is this connected? Wake up and make him known. And even as I say it, like, there's a part of me that goes, we shouldn't be surprised that that's what comes next. That even in a time of struggle and, 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 and challenge, we, we strive to make God known. We are, as the Bible says, we are compelled to make him known. Some of us might be familiar with the, the first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. If you have no idea what I said, if you just, if you, some of you are like tongue twister, like what did you just say? In this catechism, it asks this question, what, what is the chief end of man? What is the point of man? What, what, what are we ultimately made for? And, and even in a room like this, but we, could, we could get some seriously interesting answers. To get my PhD. <laughs> to make lots of money. And then you'll tag something at the end there, so that I can help lots of people. So, man, I, I pray you make lots of money and I pray you help a lot of people. That's not the chief end of man. The answer is, is man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Amen. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And let me, let me say this. What you enjoy, you share. What you enjoy, you share. You, you're, you're compelled to share it. Regardless of the season that you're in. I've heard people like in the worst season of their life going, and if you just try CrossFit, I'm telling you, it'll change your life. Like CrossFit's the best. Like they're just, they're so compelled to talk about it because they enjoy it so much. And yet there's so many people who say, I love God and I enjoy him and can't remember the last time they shared Jesus with anyone. And, and I, I can already feel it. Don't judge me. Bible says, don't judge me. Oh, well, hold on. You're the one that calls yourself a Christian. Im- imagine, imagine going to the doctor and they, like, they're absolutely horrible. They have, they have no idea what they're talking about. They give you the wrong prescription and then they still bill you at the end of it. And then you go, hey, man, like, this, is, this, is, this is wrong. And then they go, don't judge me. Like, I'm, you know, it's a whole different story. You, you're, you're, you're the one who said you're a doctor. You're the one who says you're a Christian. You're the one who says you surrendered your life to Jesus. And yet you never bring him up. Ever. And, and, and maybe, maybe it's when things are good. Right? When you get the job that you wanted. When you get the raise that you wanted. When you get the spouse that you wanted. When eventually the, the child that you've prayed for shows up, yeah, then for sure. But, but I, I believe it comes up here because it's a whole different ballpark when you're like, you know what, I am in desperation and in isolation. I want to talk about God. I want to talk about how he has not left me on my own. I want to talk about how he says he will never leave me nor forsake me and so he's right here. I want to talk about how no, he not only saves but he nurtures I am really blown away by how, I mean, for real, if you, and I say this with, with, with absolute love, please hear my heart. If you can't remember the last time you shared Jesus with anyone, then you need to pause for a moment and ask the question, like, like do I really glorify God? Am I, am I enjoying him? Now I get it. Some of y'all have just crossed the line of faith and you're like, I'm not 100% sure how to do that. No problem. We'll walk with you. That's what discipleship is. We'll help you figure out how to do it. We'll, we'll help you walk through, like, how do I share my testimony? How do I talk about Jesus? But, but you don't need to know everything. You don't need to know all the ingredients of your favorite food, to like your, 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 whatever you sit down to at a restaurant. You don't need to know everything to be like, yo, you need to come eat this thing. What's in it? I'm not 100% sure, but it tastes amazing. David says in verse 8, wake up my soul. Some of y'all need to speak to your soul. You're awake, but your soul is sleeping. Your soul is sleeping. Wake up my soul. Wake up. 
harping, liar. I, I will wake up the dawn. I will wake up the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your faithful love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth. Amen. Amen. See, in, in desperation and in isolation, if you recognize who God is, he will use that for preparation. For what? For proclamation. He'll use it for proclamation. Exalt God. Exalt Him. That's the point here. We exalt God in our lives and among people. In our lives, in our lives, we, we, we exalt God with everything that we do. This, that's why Paul writes in Colossians 3.17, and, and whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, word or deed. And this verse in Colossians goes, goes way further than most of us think. M most of us think it's like, no, it's when, it's when like, I'm just singing. Right? No, it's, it's also when you're drinking a cup of coffee. Yeah. It's to pause for a moment and to recognize like, wow, God, you, you made this. You made this. Or maybe it's when you're on the road and you're going to work, it's to recognize, God, you gave us the brains to think of this, the ability to, to move this way. Every time I get on a plane, I, just, I, I, I am filled with awe. I'm telling you, I'm filled. It's the same awe and reverence that I have when I'm standing at the ocean. Exact same. And we can't control the ocean, but we try to control planes. But I'm sitting there in that plane, and I'm just like, God, I can't believe that, that you have us getting from one place to another across continents like this. Like, how did we even come up with this? Well, we just looked at birds and we thought, you know what, maybe if we, what do you think? <laughs> and then we try to own it. Yeah, yeah, we came up with it. Yeah, it was our idea. No, it wasn't. And so we exalt God in our lives. But also, in the face of challenges, we are called to exalt God in our lives. God is exalted when we find the strength in Him to conquer our trials and persevere. Even in our weaknesses. His glory shines through when we remain devoted to serving Him through both the highs and the lows. When we, when we overcome temptations, God is exalted. Mm. When navigating trials while faithfully keeping our eyes on Jesus, God is exalted. Amen. Yeah. We can exalt God in the cave. Yeah. And so exalt Him. But we exalt Him among people as well. We should praise God among the people, telling everyone mm. that this is how God helped us. If you're trying to, like, what do I say? What do I just say? Just say, hey, I, I couldn't get myself out of this. God showed up. Yeah. And, and the world will try to convince you that, no, 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 it was you. It was your intellect and your strategy. And it's, it, don't, don't fall into that. Go, no, hold on. I hear you. But God showed up. Yeah. God showed up. Because as, as I, I, I appreciate you like my strategy. But if the, if the power of the Holy Spirit did not move through that strategy, if, if the power of the Holy Spirit did not move through my words, if the power of the Holy Spirit did not move through my body, then uh, I don't know. I don't know where I'd be. H how will people know about the faithful love of God unless we tell them about God's hand? God's hand that endures when we want to give up. That the, the only reason that we can hold on is because he's holding on to us. Some of y'all would be surprised. Like you're so excited. You're like, look, at, I'm, I'm not falling. This is incredible. Look at me. And then someone just says, look up. 
Just look up. And as you do that, you see the hand of God holding you. I got you. But how will people know if you don't tell them? If, if you just put the shine on you, then everyone thinks that you did it, that you're in control, that you have all the resources, that you have all the intellect, and it's not true. And so we tell people, we exalt him among the nations. God must be verbally praised to the people for what he has done in our lives. And it's, look, you can go like all the way to when he saved you. Because why? You could not save yourself. You could not save yourself. It's God who initiates. You are in the pit of depravity. In complete darkness. Crying out for help. And it's God who reaches down from heaven. Full of grace. Full of mercy. And grabs a hold of you and pulls you up. Because he hears you cry out, be gracious to me, God, be gracious to me. Let me close with this and the band can come up and lead us in song. We're told here that David reaches for, for musical instruments. I don't, know, I don't know if he had like a backpack with him and he had that stuff in there. We know that David was, was, was one of those guys you loved to hate. Right? He's very good looking, he's well built, and he knows how to play musical instruments. A um, little bit like Pastor Jono, but, uh, but let's, let's not go there. <clears throat> and so he reaches for musical instruments, instruments of joy and praise. That's what he reaches for. He goes, you know what, this is where I am. But God has not left me. God loves me. God has not left you. God loves you. God loves you more than you could ever imagine. And whenever you doubt that and whenever you wonder about that, you look to the finished work of Christ, that Jesus is no longer in the grave. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and He is interceding for you. He's praying for you. This allows us to reach for our musical instruments. We sing to the one who is seated on the throne and then we sing to the nations we sing to the nations David wants God's glory to cover the earth e- even in a cave I'm telling you you go to any m- missions agency and they'll tell you like no 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 that's not that's not like where you start great expanding work of God it's not in a cave it's, like, it's on a mountain top it's when life is great And yet, David goes, no, even in a cave, we can begin the work of seeing the glory of God cover the earth. He wants to see God's glory cover the earth. My question to you is, do you want to see the glory of God cover the earth? If you say yes, then you need to make sure that His glory is first covering all of you. That you are so blown away by who he is that you are compelled, you are compelled to exalt him. And as you exalt him, you are then compelled to exalt him among the nations, among the people, among your neighbors, among your colleagues, among your family members. You're just like, I can't turn this thing off. Embracing a life dedicated to glorifying God and fulfilling our ultimate purpose involves actively, hear me, actively seeking and recognizing God's grace and mercy in our lives. So maybe your prayer this morning is, soul, would you wake up? I've just been coasting here at Rooted Fellowship. Show up on a Sunday, get in my car, go home, carry on as normal. But today you're going, wake up. And, and, and for some of you, it might even be the first time. 
You've been navigating through life believing that you're a Christian. Why? Because your parents took you to church when you were little. Because you know the Bible stories. Maybe because you even have a Bible with your name on it. That's pretty cool. Those are amazing things, but, but that's not what saves you. It's only surrendering your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so maybe for you, it's the first time you're going, you know what? I'm in that pit. I'm in desperate need of a Savior. And so God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I need your help. It requires us to put our complete trust in Him, holding fast to our faith in Jesus, to trust and to believe. Regardless of our circumstances and our situations, it's to trust and believe. It's to move in the direction of the Good Shepherd. It's to hear His voice and to say, I will follow. and then to passionately share the incredible news of God's transforming work. And I, my, I, pr I pray this every Sunday. Some of y'all, I pray, I pray that God would be transforming you. One of my prayers is that, that you would walk out of here different to how you came in. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart molding and shaping you even as you're sitting here listening to his word being proclaimed molding and shaping you that you're not the same person that you were last week that you move into the different spaces of influence that you have and then people notice that like there's something different about you that that couldn't be a clearer door opening for you to share the good news of Jesus. Well, I'm glad you've noticed. I'd like to tell you about the one who's doing the transforming work in my life. His name is Jesus. And you know what? He wants to do some transforming work in you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. And I know, I know the doubts. I know that you want to push back, but, but, but you've tried everything else, haven't you? I know because, because for much of your life, I was right next to you trying the same things and they weren't enough. I kept hitting the ceiling. I'd like to introduce you to Jesus. It sounds weird to say it, but you know what? Jesus works through that as well. Last week, our little ones spent three days learning about how to bring friends to Jesus. They are fired up. Are you? And all of this will happen. All of this will happen when we recognize that the one who is seated on his throne is worthy of it all. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. He is holy, holy, holy. And so we're gonna stand and we're gonna respond in song. We're gonna respond to the one who is holy, holy, holy. No matter what season that you're in, he is holy, holy, holy. Whether you're on top of the mountain or in the valley, he is holy, holy, holy. Whether you're among the congregation or in the cave in isolation, he is holy, holy, holy and so father god we give you praise we give you all the glory would you do a work that only you can do right now in this very moment would you would you make it real father god so many of us we we're so consumed with the experience that oftentimes we miss out on the presence that you are right here in my crying, you are right here. When I feel like I can't get up, you are right here. When none of it makes any sense to me, you are right here. When, when I feel like everybody is against me, you are right here. And so we cry out holy, holy, holy. 
in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.